Hey, it's Heidi. Welcome home. I'm really glad that you found me today. We're going to talk about a pattern that is really confusing and hard to figure out. And if you are a withholder or you're in a relationship with a withholder, today's video is for you. So I'm Heidi, by the way, if you're new here, let me say welcome home again. I'm so glad you found me in the sea. That is the YouTube. How did you find me? I truly believe it's by divine design. I don't think anything happens on accident, especially the way I live my life, which is co-creating with God and the universe. And, and my prayer is always that the right person will hear exactly what they need to hear at the right time, will see what they need to see or feel what they need to feel in order to make the shift within you to move closer towards having the life and the relationships that you truly desire and deserve. Because at the end of the day, you have a black belt in suffering and in sucking it up and in being in dysfunctional relationships that are often one-sided, that often leave you feeling confused, frustrated, full of resentment, rage, and you wonder, what is a healthy relationship? And is it even possible for me to have one? And I truly believe that it is because I don't deal in pathology. I deal in patterns and patterns can be broken. So withholding is a pattern. I call it a uh, attachment personality pattern is what I've named it. And I have eight different attachment personality patterns that I've come up with. And essentially when you're born into a family dynamic that isn't healthy, it's not firing on all cylinders for whatever reason, you kind of survey the, round, the, survey the land, you look around and say, hmm, who do I need to be here in order to survive? or thrive, or connect, or simply cope with the environment that you're born into. And those are the masks or the personalities that we take on in order to function in the dysfunction. And a withholder personality is just that. It's, it's a, it's a um, coping strategy that once upon a time probably saved you from pain or um, hurt in your life. But now it's like the wall you built to protect yourself is the wall that's keeping love out and really stopping you from experiencing the joy and the happiness and the ultimate fulfillment that you seek. So my job and, and what I do with my programs and my courses is to help you untether from that pattern and break you free so that we can excavate your authentic self. I have proprietary processes, uh, therapeutic coaching models that I walk you through in order to help you break free from these patterns so that you can let that love in and learn to receive. Because for a withholder, again, that's a very scary territory. Trust is the main core wound and abandonment and rejection are at the root of all that. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the origin of the withholder today, shine some light on it. Now, if any time you're feeling like I'm singing your song and you can see yourself in these patterns that I'm talking about, I want you to consider taking the next step, which is taking responsibility for your healing and your own codependency recovery and allowing me to come alongside of you on that journey on a deeper level where you and I can get to know each other and I can support you along this path and pour into you my resources in an intimate environment where um, I'm able to learn about you and really support you in a way that's truly designed to help you with your specific challenges. And I can only do that in relationship with you. And that's why my courses are designed to foster a relationship with you so that we can connect and I can help you along in your path. Um, thank you for your comments on these videos. They're super helpful. They help the video get seen by more people. And if you're interested in that deeper dive, I want you to go over to lovecoachheidi.com and check it out and how you can get involved in your recovery, okay? So when I think of the withholder, a couple of things come to mind uh, as ways to describe. You know, I have these in my latest book, Attachment Personality Patterns, I have the five core traits. You know, have trouble expressing your feelings. You think instead of feel. You intellectualize your pain versus feel your pain, uh, poor boundaries around intimacy, trouble uh, communicating your feelings to the people that you're with, confusing vulnerability for weakness, feeling that you're weak if you have to be strong all the time, can't let anybody in, longing for intimacy but keeping people at an arm's distance. You know, all of those things that are the definers or the criteria of qualifying as a withholder, but you know inside if you feel like you're a withholder, you know, withholders are really sensitive, feeling, empathic people 
that learned that their feelings are not safe and and being in their feelings is not a safe place to be so they rejected and repressed that part of themselves some withholders for so long that they don't even know what it is they are feeling they're very out of touch you know when we think about trauma we think about the different responses fight flight freeze or fawn and fawn is mostly the one i deal in that's codependency patterns although all of them have an element of codependency patterning in them but this is really kind of a flight technique a withholder goes somewhere else they go inside they stay internal versus allowing themselves to vocalize um, their feelings and their pain they, they withhold they take it all inside a lot of people think of this withholder as kind of the lost kid and a dysfunctional family dynamic where whatever's going on outside in the family the withholder is the one that's like up in the up in their bedroom getting lost in a book you know um playing video games uh reading a lot of my clients and students that are in my programs talk about you know their escape was books i mean they just read and read and read and one of mine too this is just one little tiny bookshelf i've got a whole wall of books in my main area of my house but i escaped in books too i also think of the withholder as the story of the coconut and i heard this story from leo buscalia when i was in like a sophomore college uh sociology class and he was this guy little guy like larger than life teaching about love and he was he always told stories which i loved and he told this story of the coconut and he said once upon a time there was a little a little girl born inside of a coconut and at first she absolutely loved it because she had all the nourishing she needed she was nice and safe in there she had food she had water she had created her own little world inside this coconut to protect her and i'm adding to the story as far as our purposes are concerned but she built this layer of protection around her in order that nobody could hurt her and she stayed very safe inside of there but eventually she continued to get lonelier and lonelier inside of that coconut so she would imagine um, having the love of her life having somebody to come alongside of her and she did, was living in kind of a rescue fantasy, actually. She thought in her mind, well, one day, as I'm laying here on the beach, uh, the right person is going to come along and crack me out of my shell. And then they're going to see all the juicy goodness that is inside and the sweetness that I have to offer and all of these wonderful qualities that I have. So I'm just going to, that was her strategy. I'm just going to wait here, stay safe inside of my coconut shell, but I'm going to wait for the right person to get inside. Now you probably hear this in modern language, like I have walls. And if you're going to get to know me, you're going to have to climb my walls because I don't trust a lot of people. So good luck. You know, and maybe you don't say it like that, but maybe you just say, you know, I'm slow to warm up. I haven't really, you know, never really have allowed myself to feel deep feelings for anybody. Withholders like to have people love them more than they love the person. They like a little bit of imbalance in their relationships because if you love me more than I love you, then I don't get hurt when you leave me. That's the theory of a withholder. As crazy as that sounds, it's a protective mechanism. A withholder creates distancing techniques on purpose, makes it harder for people to be with them because their biggest fear is they will fall in love with you or you will fall in love with somebody as a withholder and need them and then they'll reject, abandon you and disappoint you. So it's safer to create a distancing, to get, invite people in, but keep them just at an arm's distance. That's the withholder's whole game and the coconut is a perfect example of that because they've got she's got this hard exterior. Do you ever try to crack a coconut? Do you ever just try with your hands or just on the ground? It's hard to crack that thing, huh? Uh, so maybe you're the same way. You're a tough nut to crack. <laughs> All right. So, but the coconut said that I, I believe in my strategy. I'm just going to wait here for the right person to come along and crack me open. And eventually, at first, she was hopeful. She was like, okay, yeah, I can get on board with this, the right person. And then she started to get bitter over time and really judgmental and harsh right people would walk by and she'd go oh no they they're not going to be able to crack me open they, they sound slow they're, they're not why even walking fast and they don't have the power they need you know well this person i hear them talking and they sound like they're dumb as a box of rocks they're not going to be able to figure out so you know this one's too dumb this one's too slow you know this one's not interesting enough you know we she had all these excuses of why nobody was coming along to crack her open but one day many years later there were people walking along the beach and they came across the coconut and kicked it open and out fell a shriveled up old dead hag. 
And they were like, oh my God, there's people inside coconuts. So they start, started scrambling around and trying to like, you know, find other people inside of coconuts. They were desperate to see like what the heck is going on, but they never found another one. And do you know why? Because that kind of a nut is one in a million. And you're one in a million too. You're a very special person. You are tough to figure out. People have said that to you as a withholder that like, I can't really ever know what you're thinking or how you're feeling. You're really hard to read. Partly because withholders are very black and white. They run hot and cold. Sometimes they are all in, but as soon as they get too close to somebody, they create a distancing technique to to restore the balance of their safety coconut, their shell, they, they armor up with their shell if they're feeling too vulnerable. So they come out, they connect, and then they'll have like a vulnerability hangover or an intimacy hangover, and then they'll create more of a wall and a shell. And then it'll be even harder to come out next time. And so you know that dance is, if you're a withholder, it's, it's maddening because there's such a longing in your heart to have to let somebody in, but you have absolutely no concept of how to make that happen. Why? It is scary as fuck for you to do that. Now, this is where we talk about the origin of the withholder. Why is it so scary to think about letting somebody in? Why do you have those walls? What is the necessity of those walls to you? When did you start to construct your first walls? Can you remember back to when the first time you got the idea that putting yourself out there and letting your feelings be known wasn't safe for you? Many of us, many of us have different stories about this, but the issue with a withholder is many times they don't remember where the origin is or their childhood because they disassociated from it. They withdrew. They went to their room and got lost in the book. Or they, uh, if it was later in life, they poured themselves into achieving and to work and started climbing ladders. And that's, that's the pattern more of the performer than the withholder. The withholder goes inside their own mind. It's like a fortress in here. There's so much going on all the time. All you do is think, 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 think. You don't feel. You think, 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 think. And so you do that because it's safer to think than it is to feel. Where did that come from? Many withholders tell me my childhood was great. I had a great, I had great parents. You know, I mean, now they, you know, they weren't great. I mean, they were okay. They were good. They were good. They did the best they could, and they kind of just got out and escaped. And so going back there to a withholder, the thought of like reviewing childhood stuff or even having an inner child conversation feels so like bullshit to the withholder. They're like, oh my God, my inner child, please, honey, come on. Can we grow up? Huh? Can we just live into the moment today? They don't want to go back into the history because it scares the shit out of them. And, and of course it does. They, they very successfully have avoided pain for a very long time. So they think. Many withholders will let out their pain because it builds and builds and builds, and that's why they're so black and white. They are binge restrictors, either with food sometimes withholders or binge restrict. They binge restrict with feelings. They'll restrict feelings with feelings, and all of a sudden they'll blow up, and the feelings will just like, boom, dip, like explode. I was going to say something so gross, but just like explode on everybody around them, and they're like, where the hell did that come from, Shirley? <laughs> And it's all inside. They thought she was cold, but no, she's very caring, but she doesn't let it out, doesn't let everybody see that. So everybody's story is a little bit different about where it comes from. And when you come inside my program, it's actually called Life School. It stands for Love Yourself First Empowerment School, where we teach all of the technology, the tools, the resources that I've come up with in order to break you free from this pattern. And there is a, there's a step-by-step -step process. There, there's a formula for this that you want to learn. It's not just, I'm going to watch a YouTube video and break free. It's work. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't want to underestimate the level of commitment it takes on your part to break free from this pattern because for sure it does. That's why my programs are a minimum of three months commitment to six months to, I want you to be with me for like a whole year because you cannot think, and if anybody tells you that you're going to break free from something overnight, is delusional and and going to and, and because you can have an epiphany overnight you can have a, a shift in your mind overnight but 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 embodying that 
and walking it through in your daily life and and making it become just a, a, a resonant part of who you are takes consistency. It takes persistence. It takes commitment. It takes dedication to walk the path to your own healing. And for some of us, putting ourselves first and making that commitment to dive in seems really scary. But if you're with somebody like myself who has the processes outlined for you, it's not that scary. You're, you are going to be safe because I know exactly how to guide you through it you know, step by step. It was hard for me too. You know, I, I considered myself one of my dominant patterns was a withholder pattern. And if I'm not careful, sometimes in my daily walk, it can still want to sneak up on me when I'm especially hurt. And I want to just go within and retreat. And I don't want to step up and confront or have a conversation about how I'm really feeling because that vulnerability can still feel hard. When I was first healing from it, and I would want to speak my truth and share how I was feeling, shame would overcome me. I would be in like a shame spiral just from wanting to share how I felt about something. I mean, it was it was really, really hard for me. I'm going to share with you a very personal story that I think takes a lot of courage to actually divulge. YouTube is a big place. Although I don't have tons and tons of people watching this video, it, it, there is an element of putting myself out there that a withholder um, would, would die at. So I've done the work to be able to share myself with you and put myself out, out there because remember, to a withholder, vulnerability is weakness. You have to be strong. Suck it up, buttercup, right? You know. So I was born very sensitive person, very sensitive. I think a lot of us who are drawn to me are, maybe you're an empath, you feel other, you feel not just your feelings deeply, but you feel the emotions or what's happening in the world very deeply and the people around you. And your sensitivity at some point, just like mine was, I'll just tell you my story. My sensitivity wasn't valued or respected, but it was made a problem. And I would, I would hear all the time, you're too sensitive. When I would be upset about something or cry or get my feelings hurt, uh, the, my abuser would say, you're too sensitive. You know, you need to suck it up. I, I got called, uh, swear alert, I got called a pussy on a regular basis as a child. Uh, Stop being a pussy. You're a pussy. Uh, just as a teenager, I got called that. You know, um, why are you crying? You shouldn't be crying. You have nothing to cry about. Oh, here we go. Oh, why are you crying? You know, that whole thing. And um, and for me, I I didn't really know how to turn that off. So I would hide. I would cry in my bedroom. I would show brave face when the verbal abuse was coming at me or the physical abuse. Um or I would protect myself, but then I would go into my room and just cry. And a lot of the times I would seethe more than I cried. I, at some point in my childhood, I stopped crying and started seething. And anger became at the root of that, where it was like I would ruminate over and over again about what I should have said or how I should have done it differently, or I would judge what I was doing um, and how I could have said the right thing to like stop the person from doing what they were doing, you know, and on and on and on. And it wasn't until I was probably around, I think, 10 or 11 when I finally snapped and I totally disassociated from my feelings and really took flight. And that's, again, that's that flight response for a withholder is like, it's not safe for me to be in my feelings. Fuck it. I'm going to turn the knob and I'm going to go somewhere else. And I went to intellectualize. So I was laying across the bed. I was about 11 years old. I, I imagine I, so much of my memory, as so many trauma survivors is, is gaps. It is fog. It's like, I don't remember my childhood. And if you're there, just know that's very normal. Trauma damages the memory part of your brain. It's normal to lose years. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, um, that you have a repressed memory that you need to, you need to remember. Sometimes it just means the things that you know, you endured the little clips, the times when it was so bad for you, you just took flight. Okay. And had to get out of there. So as I was laying across the bed, I was getting beat with the belt, and this was not uncommon for me. Um, and I was getting beat, my pants were down, and I was getting beat with the belt, and um, something in me snapped. It hurt like hell, like it always did. And I remember like that my abuser used to take the belt and snap it. And I, I still can't hear somebody snap their belt like this. You know, you make the little thing and go like this. Um, 
it, 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 it just li- trauma lives in the body, you know? So your body remembers when you hear that sound, it's like, ooh. Uh, so anyway, I was getting beat with the belt. And in that moment, something snapped and besides the belt. And I said to myself, I'm not going to cry today. And it was almost like I went robotic. And I said, I intellectualized that if I cry, they win. So my motto was vulnerability is weakness. So you're not gonna win, you're not gonna win because I'm gonna be strong and I win. Now that's really sick. We can see when an eleven year old can't really rationalize that she's not winning anything. She's still getting beat. She's still getting hurt. The only thing she does is pretend it's not happening or pretend that her power is rescuing and saving her from being in pain. So that's what I did. I went into my mind and I developed this inner strength of you're not going to see me cry. You're not going to crack me. And that's really the moment that I feel my withholder was born. And it continued to grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. And I started to be attracted to personal development that echoed that same notion, along with the performer attachment personality pattern, which is change, so what? Just ignore how you're feeling, suck it up. It's very masculine, patriarchal way to view things. Doesn't matter how you feel, do it anyway. You know, fuck the pain, go go push on push on and actually it took me a long time to remember and understand that pain is your compass it is your barometer your smoke signal to your spirit and soul that something's not right uh pain is a gift to understand what you need to get out of and get released from but because i got so used to suffering through the pain and convincing myself i wasn't hurt and pretending i wasn't hurt that when I would get into relationships as an adult, people would hurt me and I wouldn't tell them why I didn't want to seem too needy. So when somebody would ask me in a relationship, if they're, if I was hurt, I would say, no, I'm fine. And then I would be passive aggressive or I would drink alcohol, binge drinking, binge, binge restrict cycle can also be with a withholder with their drinking. And you might find that you do this as well. And then when I would drink, I would let out all that pent up emotion. And so what is the path to healing, you know, for a withholder? Well, as we move through the program that I have called Life School, the really the first step is awareness of your patterning. And we do a deep dive. I have many processes that I walk you through to understand where your withholder developed, how she shows up or he shows up, uh, how the, the trigger feelings that you experience that alert you, you're in a pattern, behavior pattern that that is in within this personality pattern of the withholder. And then I systematically walk you through a process I created called the rapid detachment method. So after you identify your attachment pattern, I then help you um, uh, rectify that and detach from that pattern so that you can excavate your actual authentic self and who you really are. So for me, it was a walk back to my sensitivity. My sensitivity is my superpower. It's what enables me to, when I'm tuned in, to sit with a client and discern, uh, have that gift to be able to see what's really going on. But that's a sensing thing, not a thinking thing. It's not a mental thing. It's a spiritual thing that's on the spiritual plane. And everything has to be lined up, mind, body, spirit. And if something's out of alignment or something is blocked, then we're not able to to embrace our full power. And so the th- the, the goal is to help you identify the pattern, untether, detach from the pattern, and excavate your authentic self, ultimately, so you can be in your power. Why do you need power? Power and self-esteem self-esteem and power from that power from the authentic place of rooted in your true self and your true value and your true worth isn't a narcissistic quality it's not a it's not a this i'm so confident full of myself uh, quality it's really understanding your divinity within you embracing that and feeling very extremely uh unfuckwithable where nothing really shakes you because you're so rooted and in your value and owning where you are and who you are and you get to this place where you're so comfortable in your own skin and being with your emotions that you use you're not afraid of them anymore you know they don't scare you anymore and then other people's emotions don't scare you either you divine you're not running from conflict you're able to stand and root in your opinion and you know withhold her when i first was recovering from this and learning how to feel my feelings i would and assert my opinion when it differed uh, 
I would cry a little bit, you know, in meetings inappropriately. And that's what withholders can experience. It's like they, they don't want to cry, but they'll be in a meeting. All of a sudden they'll start crying. They'll be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. They're apologizing for crying. And they're like, but that's, that's a common thing that I see all the time. And it's learning how to be in charge of yourself by letting your emotions come through that want to come through. And so, you know, as, as much as I love the personal development world with like change your state, you know, uh, you could call your feelings like you call a dog, you know, as much as I, I valued that, the more I healed, the more I understood that there's nothing to change. My feelings are divine. They are valid. They are worthy of my attention. They are, imp- they are my compass. And so instead of changing my state from misery to bliss in misery, I just get out of fucking misery. How's that? (laughs) So if you find this useful, I know this is a longer video today, but it's such an important topic. It's so complex. That's why we take three months to 12 months to dissect it all. It's rich content. It's not a, it's not a bandaid on a flesh wound. It is a permanent cure for codependency okay Uh, so I hope that you are at least interested enough to keep coming back for the videos you know to subscribe to leave a comment because it helps us help more people but ultimately I'd like for you to consider um, having the courage to allow me to come in and I know that you do not trust a lot of people I understand I was the same uh, but if you feel resonant, if, if what I'm saying resonates with you, just know that you likely are a sister or a brother on the path. It's by divine design that you're here. And if you feel called in any way to at least even get more information, I want to encourage you to take the next step and schedule a consultation so we can see if this is the avenue for you, if this is the path. And if it is the path, I'm happy to walk it with you. Okay. All right. I love you so much. Take excellent care of yourself and I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye.